Hey, how's it going everyone? It's Roman, I'm back. And today I want to talk about equity derivatives, specifically why we develop the notion of a stock price process and what this does for us in modeling the price of these particular equity derivatives. Now, the simplest case is going to be the vanilla, the liquid instruments, ones that are traded all of the time, the ones that are standardized on exchanges, and that's the example that we are going to use for this video to develop intuition as to why we want to establish these processes in the first place. And then we can talk about the implications of these processes and what we can do to improve them. In this context, when I talk about equity derivatives, I'm talking about options. And for this particular example, to build our intuition, I'm going to be talking about European options. Now, if you haven't seen my previous video describing European options in detail, I highly recommend you check that out. We're gonna do a brief crash course here before we start to build some intuition as to why these stock price processes are useful. Let's go ahead and start with an example European call option. So a European call option is going to give the holder of the contract the right but not the obligation to purchase the underlying asset at some time, capital T in the future, for a price called the strike price. Now, both of those things at the time the contract is purchased is known. So those are deterministic factors of the contract. If I go out to an exchange today, I know what the strike price is that I'm buying the contract at, and I know when that contract is going to expire. So if we know all these things, then we can go ahead and model the payoff of the contract at maturity. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a graph to visualize our payoff. This is essentially how much money we make from this call option, this European call option. So on the x-axis, we're gonna have S of capital T, and S of capital T is going to represent the stock price, assuming the underlying is a stock, at time capital T. Capital T is just some point in the future. This could be three months from now, this could be six months from now, this could be a year from now. It's just to denote the passage of time. This is at some time in the future whenever this particular contract expires. On the y-axis, we are going to have our payoff. And I'm just going to denote that P. Okay, great, now I'm going to denote the strike price. That is the price that we can pay for the stock at this time, capital T, and that is going to be K. And what this means is if we look at our payoff, this is going to be zero. And if we draw a horizontal line up to K, that is going to denote the range that we choose not to exercise this option contract, meaning we choose not to purchase at the strike price. Why is this the case? Well, at time capital T, anything within this region is going to mean that we can purchase the stock at a lower price just by going into the market and buying. So that is going to be buying at the spot price at this time, capital T. So if that's the case, we don't want to just go out and pay a higher price for a stock that, that's never going to be beneficial for us. So in this case, if we have that the stock price is less than the strike price and we have a European call option, we are not going to be exercising. Now, in the case that the stock price at time capital T exceeds the strike price, then we are in fact going to choose to exercise. Not only that, but we are going to see this linear portion of the chart representing our payoff. And this is the typical hockey stick diagram that you would see from an elemental securities analysis or derivatives pricing course. Uh, at time capital T, this is the payoff function for a European call. And you can just go ahead and represent this as the maximum between the difference in the stock price at time capital T less the strike price and zero. Meaning whichever value is greater, we are going to go ahead and pick that one. And that is the chart that we see right here representing the payoff of this European call option. Now that we've developed this notion of a payoff function for our European call option, there are a lot of interesting ways we can go with this. We can talk about long versus short positions. We could talk about European puts. We could talk about portfolios of options, straddles, strangles, iron condors. We can talk about these different option strategies, but that is not the sole focus of this video. The sole focus of this video is to build intuition as to why we want a stock price process to help us in modeling these equity derivative prices 
today. And that's going to be the key word here. So if you're interested in those other topics that I had mentioned, definitely check out my previous video on European options where I dive more in depth into European puts and calls and long and short positions, things of that nature. But here, we're going to start to build this intuition now as to why we want a stock price process. To do this, we can simply draw a new chart. So what I wanna do down here is I want to draw another chart and what I'm gonna do is draw a path of a stock price. Now this is gonna make sense in a moment, so go ahead and bear with me. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to draw on the X axis, we have time. And on the Y axis, we are going to have the stock price at a particular time T. Then I'm going to go ahead and draw one possible path that this stock takes, just like that. So what do we have here? We have the underlying asset and how it moves throughout time. And we have the payoff function of the European call option above. How are these two things connected? Well, very simply, if we go down here and we mark the time capital T here, we can see at time capital T, we are going to have the right, but not the obligation to exercise that European call option. But what are we going to be exercising at? We're going to be exercising at the price K. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna draw a horizontal line to represent the price K. And as you can see in this example, the stock price at time capital T is greater than K, meaning that the max of S sub capital T and K is going to be different and greater than zero. So this is where everything starts to come together. These two charts are linked by the stock price at time capital T. Now, what is the problem with that? Well, if you look at both of these charts, we are modeling this connection based on the stock price at time capital T, right here. What's the problem with that? Well, we're not at time capital T. We are in fact at time zero or contemporaneous time right here. We are living in the present moment, baby. We do not know what the stock price is at time capital T. To put it in other words, nobody. I don't care if you're Warren Buffett or if you're Jimmy Buffett, nobody knows if the stock is gonna go up, down, sideways, or in fucking circles, least of all stockbrokers. Couldn't have said it much better myself. That is exactly why we want to develop this notion of a stock price process, because we are at time zero. We are at time zero. We don't know this is the path that the stock price is going to take, and we're gonna end up here. That's what a stock price process is going to enable us to do by making a whole bunch of different assumptions about how the stock price behaves, we can go ahead and create a distribution of stock prices at time capital T. So we are going to have maybe one path that looks like this. Maybe we have another path that looks like this. Maybe we have a path that looks like this. Maybe we have a path that looks like this and so on and so forth and we are going to get a distribution of stock prices at time capital T. And this distribution of stock prices is exactly what we are going to use to help us in determining what we should pay for the potential to realize some sort of payoff at time capital T based on the information available to us today at time zero. Okay, so we need a stock price process so that we can model this distribution of the stock price at time capital T to help us price our European call option today. But what stock price process should we choose? Should we choose an arithmetic Brownian motion, a geometric Brownian motion? Should we use a local volatility model? Should we use a Heston model? Should we use a Bergomi model? Should we start to get into the rough model family? Should we look at a rough Bergomi model? How should we actually develop the notion of our pricing functional? Should we use maybe Monte Carlo simulations? How do we solve this pricing problem? Well, these are all very, complicated and very important topics to discuss. In fact, if you start to look at more of the, the current streams of research in the literature, uh, the employment of 
neural networks and machine learning algorithms isn't to improve on the financial mathematics literature in the context of effectiveness, but rather efficiency, which I find to be incredibly interesting. And if you're interested in that topic, check out my video on deep learning rough volatility, where we look at exactly that, the increase in efficiency for calibration and pricing of a rough Bergomi model using a deep neural network. But that's all beyond the scope of this video, beyond the point of this video. We've just developed this notion of the necessity of a stock price process. So what I wanna do is kind of leave you with two processes. The first one is an arithmetic Brownian motion. The second one's a geometric Brownian motion, both of which I have solutions to on this channel. You can go ahead and check those out. But I wanna talk briefly about both and sort of why the geometric is an improvement from an arithmetic. Uh, in the context of the assumptions. Rewind some 123 years ago and you'll find the father of financial mathematics toying around with an arithmetic Brownian motion to develop what we know today as the Bachelier model. That is, if we assume that this stock price process, this distribution here is governed by an arithmetic Brownian motion, we can go ahead and develop the pricing function at time zero, not the payoff function at time capital T that we see here, but rather the price that we should pay today for that call option using an arithmetic Brownian motion. Louis Bachelet, 1900, this is the arithmetic Brownian motion for a model of the stock price process. And what does that look like? Well, we have an ABM, arithmetic Brownian motion, DXT is equal to mu DT plus sigma DWT, with WT is a standard Brownian motion, this is a continuous time representation, perhaps it's driftless, and we have dxt is equal to sigma dwt, where the solution is quite simply found by integration. And we have this idea of some bounds, perhaps we have zero to capital T, and this is our process. This is our distribution at time capital T. If we were to integrate using these bounds, we would find x sub cap t less x sub zero is equal to sigma times w cap t less w of zero. And that can just be found by doing the, the telescoping sum argument where w of zero is typically defined as zero. We end up with this idea that x sub t is equal to x sub zero plus sigma times w sub cap t, where w sub cap t is a standard Brownian motion. Okay, so now we have a stock price process governed by a stochastic differential equation. We have a solution to that stochastic differential equation. We have the original stochastic differential equations here and the solution here. And this is going to give us that distribution of stock prices at time capital T. Now, we still need to go ahead and develop the notion of the pricing function for the European caller put option. And it turns out we can do that in closed form with the arithmetic Brownian motion. We can also do it in closed form with the geometric Brownian motion. And we have the uh, FFT pricing for a Heston stochastic volatility model as well, if you wanna get a little more complex and talk about fitting skews and so on and so forth. But once again, beyond the scope of this video, we're gonna talk about ABM, arithmetic Brownian motion, and the downfalls of it, and the improvements made by geometric Brownian motion. Uh, and then we're gonna go ahead and wrap up this video. If you're interested in deriving the pricing equation, you can go ahead and check out my previous video, how to derive the black scholes merton partial differential equation, where we go ahead and assume a geometric Brownian motion, use it as lemma, and construct a hedge portfolio, and we, we go through the entire pricing argument. But here, let's go ahead and switch gears and talk about geometric Brownian motion. Okay, so why geometric Brownian motion and not an arithmetic Brownian motion? Well, simply put, arithmetic Brownian motion can generate negative asset prices, which can cause some issues in modeling our stocks, as stocks cannot be negative. Now, we have seen some cases where assets can be negative, and a Bachelet model may be appropriate, um, or maybe a displaced model is more appropriate, which is most likely the case. Nevertheless, we're gonna talk about a geometric Brownian motion, which generates asset prices that cannot be negative. So if we scroll down here, I'm going to go ahead and write a GBM. And this GBM, geometric Brownian motion, is governed by a stochastic differential equation. DXT over XT is equal to mu DT 
plus sigma dWt. Typically, this may be written as dxt is equal to mu xt dt plus sigma xt dWt. Now, I am not going to solve this one because I've already solved this on my channel and I don't want to break out Eta's lemma and I don't want to do a log transformation and I'm not interested in doing that right now. So if you are interested in checking that out, check out my other video. I solved this. I have a whole write-up in LaTeX that you can check out. But this is the price process, the stock price process for geometric Brownian motion. And this is the stock price process that we use to find the Black-Scholes Merton partial differential equation and eventually the pricing function for European call and put options the infamous Black-Scholes model. I want to thank you so much for watching this video. If you would like to support the channel, go ahead, leave a like, subscribe, join Discord, check out our courses on Quant Guild. If you'd like to, you can even join our Patreon. And uh, if you have any comments, suggestions, questions, feel free to drop a comment, head to Discord. We have some interesting conversations there, um, even about current literature topics. If you have any more specific questions and terms of pricing, definitely reach out to me. Always happy to discuss. Um, other than that, I'll see you in the next one.